We're taking a look today at what we're calling the great reshuffle. There are some estimations that half of all employees actually plan to leave their jobs this year. What's going on? Here to help us make sense of it are journalists and authors, Anne Helen Peterson and Charlie Warzel. Both of them have a book coming out later this year called Out of Office, The Big Problem and Bigger Promise of Working from Home. And Charlie, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So what is going on? Well, I think uh, what, what is going on right at the moment is we are emerging uh, to some degree uh, from the deepest parts of a pandemic in which uh, our lives were obviously greatly interrupted uh, and uh we were we were essentially forced to labor in confinement for a long period of time. Productivity in business didn't just you know go away completely. Uh, the, the sort of the thing that bosses told workers for so long, which was that you know you needed to be in the office uh, to have a functioning healthy company, uh, it was basically proven incorrect. Um, and at the same time, uh, you know during this really difficult moment, so many people stepped up. And now that we're emerging from this moment, uh, I think what we're seeing is this kind of combination of uh, deep, deep worker burnout, worker resentment, alongside this notion that um, you know we might actually be able to rethink some of the some of the classic fundamental tenets of work, which is this this notion of you know nine to five in the office uh, laboring. So I think what you have is this kind of, you know, this malleable moment um, where there's more possibility perhaps than there was before, but it's also coupled with this deep, bone deep fatigue and frustration with, you know, the the way that the work is so central in all of our lives. And is it really going to change? Really? Because I'm hearing from people as they're rethinking work. One person said, oh, our boss is giving us five days in the summer where we can take Fridays off or take a half day. Uh, we are allowed to have now 30 minute lunches scheduled into our calendars. <laughs> oh, here's the best one that I've heard. We get to come back to work only three days a week, but we're going to Zoom from our offices, which is exactly what we would have done when we are at home. Is corporate America really rethinking work? I think it really depends on the company. I think some companies are very reluctant to mess with the status quo, right? They felt anxiety over the last 18 months, um, maybe felt that like, okay, it's all right that we are maintaining productivity, but we still don't want to mess with the, the way that the hierarchy works in our offices, the way that we conceive of management, the sort of people that get promoted, right? Um, I think that a lot of that is resistant to change and it takes a lot of reconsidering and thoughtful uh, reorganization in order for any of that to change. A lot more than simply adding 30 minutes to a lunch calendar, right? But I do think that you, a lot of companies are facing attrition if they don't start to rethink some of these things. One thing that I have heard a lot from workers, and we're talking specifically about office workers here, is that their burnout is so severe, their frustration and their exhaustion, that taking some vacation is not going to fix it, right? Even taking like two weeks is not, that's it's not enough. The only way that they can deal with some of that exhaustion is to quit. Right. And maybe take some time to actually rest and recover. And, I, and many office workers, not all by many in any means, but many have a little bit of a financial cushion as a result of just not spending as much over the past 18 months. Mm -hmm. And then some people just need a restart. You know, I think of it as like a, a relationship that's so toxic that you're like, no amount of therapy can fix this, right? <laughs> like you just have to, to stop and, and restart. But I think there's a crucial recognition that needs to happen that, you know, quitting your job is not going to fix the way that you position work in your life. It has to be a much more intentional and thoughtful reorganization than that. When you look at the numbers today, 50% of the workforce are made up by millennials. They're in what many consider the prime of their career. They're between 25 to 40. Some people might say they have more leverage than ever before. This concept um, of how they view work, how is it different from maybe Generation X or boomers? I mean, I do think millennials still wanna work, right? <laughs> I do, but I also think that they wanna work differently. Um, 
many millennials that I have talked to and young Gen X have become disillusioned with the idea that their work is their entire purpose, right? That it should be the dominating um, axis of their lives. And so I think that companies that can think about how not just to cultivate quote unquote work-life balance, right? Because we know that that's a first, more to think about how can we actively encourage a different relationship to work that also incentivize, incentivizes really high productivity, great quality, you know, retention rates, really uh, positive work culture and making your organization a place where people want to work. That's what the future of these corporations are going to be. I've spent two decades as a journalist, as you, you guys too are journalists. And as a news anchor, I was like chained to the desk for hours on end. I took the train in at 7 a.m., came back by 8 p.m. I am never going back to that lifestyle ever again. And I have a confession. 15 minutes before this interview, I was playing tennis. Here's my tennis racket. Right the on. Reason the reason my hair is pulled back, and if it looks sweaty, it's because it was. I was on the <laughs> tennis court. <laughs> and here I am with you guys. How do you think culture is going to change? Because we have such a different take, but what will corporations be okay with this? I think it's in the long-term interest for corporations to be okay with this. You know, uh, a lot of the reporting that we found and, and, and then sort of the analysis we've done, talking to both executives, bosses, you know, people in charge of companies and, you know, workers, uh, is that like, is ultimately, there is a lot of, you know, to borrow a business word, synergy between the things that are good for workers' lives uh, and what's good for a company in the long run. And that's the, that's the key word there, is in the long run. So, you know, when you think about you going to play tennis, you know, in the early morning or middle of the, middle of the day and, and coming back, I mean, you've just done something for yourself. You've taken some time you're, you know, you're energized, you're, you're refreshed, you're, you know, you don't have that sort of like back to back to back to back Zoom meeting malaise. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, there's a little bit of delight to be able to have your day broken up. And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. You know, if you were going to go play tennis at, at 5 or 6 p.m. versus playing it at 930 in the morning, uh, in the middle of the day. And, and I think that that is what, you know, what the pandemic taught so many people is that you can, it, it, it's not really about when you're working, it's about how you're working. Um, and, and I think that, you know, there's going to be a lot of offices and bosses that are reticent to, to build in that flexibility, because they think it's going to be abused. But what that comes down to is they don't trust their workers to get the job done. How do you think COVID is going to ultimately affect the future of work? The phrase that we've borrowed from, uh, I, I believe it's the journalist George Packer, uh, is this idea uh, of a plastic hour. That what, what the pandemic did was it took a lot of things that were unmovable, unmalleable, and, and made them, you know, forced us to sort of bend, bend the conventions of a lot of um, modern life. One of them, obviously, was, was how we work. Uh, and so I think you can't really put that you know, that, that back. Uh, you can't really just go directly back to the way things were. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, the, the classic excuse from HR or from a boss was, you know, like, we trust maybe you to take, you know, Fridays uh, and work from home. But if everyone did that, uh, it would be really bad for the company. Or if everyone worked, you know, had this flexible schedule. Well, the pandemic proved that's wrong. And it did that with with a number of things in the workplace, including, you know, productivity, et cetera. And, and so I think the long-term effect of the pandemic is going to be that, you know, it, it sort of poked holes in a lot of the, the classic management excuses. What would your advice be to the companies that employ people? How is it changing? I mean, are companies woke enough to understand that there's a transformative change happening in the workforce? I mean, honestly, it's, it's a very simple element that it all comes down to at the end, which, which, which is trust, right? I mean, it, it, it honestly really is about whether or not you trust you know, the, the people that you've hired to, to understand how to do their jobs and, and, and to, get, you know, to get things done. And, and I think that that trust comes from you know, what, what we've seen in our reporting and in our research is that a lot of that trust comes from, from management and executives modeling vulnerability 
right? Hmm. Showing showing that you know, like not sort of ruling by the, an iron fisted decree, uh, and and I think that that is really like it's the main principle to, to all of this. And Charlie, I think why is yeah. Char- Charlie, why is vulnerability so important? Well, it, it's important because it shows, you know, it shows that the, the people, you know, quote unquote in charge are, are, are human beings as well that are all subject to the same forces where, you know, managers feel like they have to, you know, model a, a very, uh, you know, kind of intense um, uh, sort of feeling of being above it all. Uh, that they're not subject to these sorts of things. And when they model that, uh, you know, unflappable uh, ness, whatever you want to call it, then the workers feel like they have to sort of emulate that, mm. that they can't confess to them that they're having a really hard time, mm. that they need to take the time off. Um, and, and I think it, it creates this sort of vicious cycle. But if you do model that, that vulnerability, you know, I, some of the best executives we've seen are people who say, I, I'm going to take a lot of this time off because I need it, because I am really? burned out. Because who, who in the corporate world, what executive is doing that? Do you, is there oh, any a executive? Lot. Really? A that lot. are showing yeah. vulnerability? Who? Well, I, spe- I, I think it's vulnerability, but also specifically the time off component. Mm. And that is something that you are seeing more and more companies, I think, more old-fashioned ones, more nonprofits, places that are tech companies that are saying, not only am I going to take this time off, but I'm going to email the entire company and say I am taking this time off to try to set an example that goes from the C-suite all the way down to say PTO is important and it is an essential part of our business model. If we don't take it, we're, productivity levels are going to go down and we're just going to burn through our workforce. So ultimately, when you look at this new work-life balance, how do you think it's going to transform work? I mean, I it has the potential to transform quite a bit about it. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think the work actually changes a ton. I mean, if you look at, you know, companies like uh, Microsoft in Japan instituted a four day work week, and that's not, you know, we're going to work a ton during those four days. That's just eight hours a day, standard work days, but just not working on, on Fridays. And productivity went up, worker satisfaction went up, satisfied workers, satisfied employees are actually cheaper employees in the long run. It's cheaper for, for companies. Um, but I think like the main message there is that you know we're spending a lot of time doing this performative work, whether that's exchanging emails or Slack messages or Microsoft Teams messages, you know, a lot of this communication to show that you're working, to show that you're busy all the time. And, you know, we, we surveyed a, a, a lot of people in our reporting and most of them, you know, we didn't even ask for this, but most of them confessed at some point that they do the bulk of their work during like these sprints during the week, right? Like three or four hours where <clears throat> the kids are, you know, the kids are asleep and gone and I can get everything done that I needed to for the week. We have so much more work in our lives than actual work that we need to do. And so people changing their schedules, getting, you know, having that flexibility and working when they need to work and getting what they need to do done. I mean, that's going to transform our outside lives, but it's not going to transform, you know, how much business gets done. I don't, I don't think. Dolly Parton needs to write a new song, redo work in nine to five. Like y'all, we're not coming back nine to five, taking the train no, to the office. It's like nine to nine to 11, one to two, seven to eight, you know, like it's whatever you want to make it. <laughs> it's going to be a weird song. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would also just add to this that like one uh, one of the big insights that that we kind of came to from the book is is that this is going to be hard work. Like I, I I I think people look at at especially remote life or working from home as this kind of this thing you can just give to people and just say, okay, like it's done. We've given you two days, you know, remote or, or we're fully distributed. You can do whatever you want. And I think that those companies are going to be destined to have a, a lot of difficulty uh, implementing that. Like th- this, like any business decision is something that, you know, needs to be planned for. It needs to be done with care. Uh, it needs to be done really intentionally. It should be treated as a new way to work. And I think that the, at the end of the day, Annie had this, this, this great line that like, work, you know, remote work is not about the where, it's about the how, it's mm. about how we work. And I think that that is ultimately, you know, the, 
the most sort of salient point of, of, of this whole movement. That's so well said. Well, Anne and Charlie, I want to thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. It's our Thanks pleasure. For us. Thank you.